Um, so this is the session two of the of the conference, inflation effects of supply disruption. So we have two very interesting paper. So first, Ian Lee from the University of International Business and Economics is going to present the paper, the causal effect of global supply chain disruption on macroeconomic outcomes, theory and evidence. And then like uh, Frank Smith is going to discuss. So you have 25 minutes and the floor is yours. Okay, I'm just going to make a start. Um, thank you so much for having me and also having our paper in the program. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Jesus, uh, Xiu and Francesco. And um, so it's very preliminary. So any comments and questions are welcome. So uh, I have to say we had, um, Dennis and I, uh, we had a short discussion before this meeting. Um, and so we were kind of wondering whether the ordering of our presentations could be altered. Uh, because as you will see, uh, Dennis's paper is more on the application of the GSCPI index, the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, uh, compiled by the uh, New York Fed. But our paper is more on uh, hitting that very hard because we're trying to create a new index uh, and show it uh, it is a better index. Uh, so feel free to um, leave your comments in the end. Uh, without further ado, let me... Uh, start the presentation. So we have a very big umbrella question uh, in the front, which is uh, what are the causal effects and policy implications of global supply chain disruptions on the US economy? Um, so this is a very broad question. So we break that down into actually three parts. So the first thing is we wanted to know what are the shortcomings of those existing measures of global supply chain disruptions? And if you dive uh, deep into the literature, uh, in this line of literature, you will see that uh, a majority of them centered on essentially two pillars. So the first pillar are um, the transportation costs. Here, I mean uh, shipping prices, uh, you know, uh, flight, flight, you know, flight, essentially shipping prices. And then the other one is the purchasing managers index, uh, which uh, includes something like delivery times, backlogs. Um, so, um, as I will argue later. So these two measures have their own shortcomings, in particular for transportation costs, because we know that it is a price measure. So inherently, it will internalize any changes in prices coming from the demand side. So it's not pure enough. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of the PMI index, because it is based on responses to survey questions uh, from those purchasing managers, uh, inevitably that will subject to very large measurement errors. Um, so, uh, among, you know, given these two indices, um, so there is a very famous one by the New York Fed's Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, which has been used not only in academic, but also in policies, uh, you know, um, it's also building on these two uh, components, transportation costs and PMI. And I will show you later, uh, comparing the results, uh, you know, our results with theirs, you will see very different readings of the causal effects of global supply chain disruptions, at least for the U.S. economy. So this is the first question. And then moving on, uh, we wanted to know how does this supply chain disruption shock differ from other shocks? Because, um, you know, this question is directly speaks to this very vast literature on this entanglement of shocks during the uh, pandemic period. Uh, as we know, a convolution of demand shocks, labor supply shocks, and supply chain you know, disturbances hit the global economy very hardly. Um, so I will define what do we mean by supply chain disruption later on, actually in the next slide, but this is the second question we wanted to answer. And then finally, uh, you know, what we wanted to know what are the policy implications. So first of all, uh, naturally, you will wonder, you know, whether the policy institutions should opt for on, you know, monetary tightening on a whole steady approach, um, you know, in, you know, in response to the heightened inflation, for example, in the United States. So uh, I got this idea from the from the article by Philip Pen Philip Lane, um, but then I I you know we actually we we go a little bit further by asking um, you know does this supply chain disruption alter the stabilization bias uh, of monetary policy in controlling inflation and output because you will uh, you will you know I think this is kind of related to um, these three presentations in the morning because. As long as we know that the stabilization by you know stabil stabilization trade off has sort of changed, then maybe there's a possibility for a soft landing for the US economy because uh, type monetary timing could do more than you know what it was intended in the very beginning. Uh, but this is this, you know, the last question we wanted to answer in this paper. So, uh, let me go through some of the things that we have done in this paper. 
So first of all, I wanted to uh, tell you that we actually measure supply chain disruptions using this notion of port congestion. So as you may know that, you know, this container ports, uh, you know, major container ports, they were actually responsible for more than 60% of the total value of seaborne trade worldwide. So they are very influential, but at the same time, I'm sure, you know, all of you have read those, uh, for example, newspapers from the Financial Times, also those reports from the IMF, even White House on, you know, the importance of studying uh, port congestion uh, in terms of global supply chain disruption. So that's why we take this very stance. But this is not an easy task because uh, with all the proper data and the proper tool, you will not be able to quantify port congestion. So that's why we de develop a uh, new spatial clustering algorithm based on machine learning to essentially transform this very high frequency set, you know, satellite data of container ships into a high frequency measure of port congestion actually applicable to major ports worldwide. So this is very influential, but um, you know, we're just basically going to use this measure as a global supply chain disruption measure throughout the paper. So this is the first thing that we uh, we're doing this paper. And then uh, since eventually we wanted to use our measurement and our theory to recover the causal effects of global supply chain disruptions, and in the realm of structural wars, we need some identification restrictions. So that's why we opt for a novel analytic theory to study the role of spare capacity resulting from the mismatch between supply and demand. So the idea is very simple. So. Um, as you may know, you know this during the pandemic, global supply chain disruptions actually lead to very high level of transportation costs, in particular shipping price. The key mechanism in our model is that, okay, now the shipping price is at very high level. That leads to, um, you know, reduce the probability of a profitable trade. So thinking of myself as an exporter in Shanghai and my course of Francesco as an importer in Los Angeles. So if I'm going to pay a very high price to ship my good to Francesco in Los Angeles, and this, this price is so high that uh, it's no longer profitable for me to make this trade, then trade will collapse. And then that will have macro consequences in terms of uh, spare capacity and all the other stuff. So this is the key mechanism we have in the theory. Uh, but uh, in the end, we managed to come up with some very unique identification restrictions for the demand shock, for the labor supply shock, and also supply chain disturbances, which we could use alongside our measurement into structural VRs for the causality assessment. And then, as I mentioned, the third thing would, of course, be the causality assessment to integrate both of them into the uh, into the discussion. Uh, and uh, in this part, we actually compare our measure, the results using our measure uh, with those, you know, using the GICPI, and you will see that they are quite different in terms of the results. And then lastly, I think it is very closely related to the three presentations in the morning, which is a state dependence analysis, studying the interplay between the supply chain disruptions and the effect effectiveness of monetary policy in controlling inflation and output. Um, so, just in a nutshell, we actually predict the possibility uh, of a soft landing for the U.S. economy. So this is somehow consistent with, uh, for example, uh, the presentation given by Gorty in the, in the, in the morning. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to the details of this, you know, this lines of literature that uh, we connect to. But essentially, we have, you know, theory of this equilibrium. For example, building on some work by Michelet and size uh, and also Michel Gaspi, uh, who is also here uh, in the present uh, in this conference. And also, we connect to transportation sector and also this entanglement of supply chain disturbances. So uh, let me jump straight away to the measurement of global supply chain disruption, because according to the my co-author with the longest name, this is the most interesting part of the the paper. Um, so. Uh, let me try to go through this with you very, very uh, slowly, uh, just to sh just to highlight, you know, this measure is really something influential. So, like I mentioned, uh, we measure disruptions to the supply chain by studying congestion at those container ports. And then how did we do this? So we go back to the, uh, maybe this is somehow, I have to push you away from the your comfort zone by going into the maritime literature, because in, Maritime economics, they have a very clear measure of port congestion, which is the likelihood that a container ship will first moor in an anchorage within the port before docking at birth. 
So even though those two terms might sound quite technical, but you can think of the anchorage as a random area in a port where a container ship can lower its anchor. So this is quite random. But then for a burst, it's actually a designated spot in the port where the container ship will load and unload its cargo. So uh, the key question is whether, you know, if there were no congestion, no port congestion at all, you know, naturally, if a container ship, for example, um, you know, going into the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, it will directly go to the berths to have their, to have its cargo loaded or unloaded. But it's just because port, con because port congestion, it is not able to do so anymore because there are few ships, a lot of ships waiting ahead of this container ship. So, you know, this ship, ferry ship has to wait in the anchorage. So uh, we, in order to quantify port congestion using this definition, we essentially need two pieces of uh, information and tools. So the first one is we will need information on the movements of those container ships. So we, uh, we do this through the help of the automatic, automatic identification system. So this is a very, um, it, it was actually there for quite a long time, but the data uh, was only available after 2017. But essentially this is a system installed all the vessels uh, to track its movements, uh, you know, essentially 24 seven and across the entire world. Um, and then that's the information, you know, the data source. But then in order to process this data, because this, this AIS data actually update, you know, is actually updated every two seconds. We need some heavy machinery in order to transform this high frequency data into something useful. So that's why we develop a machine learning uh, spatial clustering algorithm. So that's why you see that I'm pushing you away from economics uh, to process data and then find something useful. So uh, in order to illustrate all of this, let me just show you several figures because I think this is more intuitive. So as you can see in this figure, this is essentially uh, a snapshot of the AIS observations outside the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach since January 1st, 2020. So each of these blue dots represents a uh, container ship essentially, um, you know, in that period. So what we wanted to do is actually to, um, to distinguish whether some of the ships were actually waiting in the anchorage uh, and some of the ships were, you know, loading and all of this stuff in the, in the bursts. So to do this, we developed this algorithm. Uh, it's quite complicated, but uh, it's essentially working in two layers, uh, you know, based on, you know, density of more importance and also some of the other information as granular as what I show in this figure, which is the headings of these container ships. For example, as you can see on the left-hand panel here, the headings of the container ships are quite opposite when they docking at the berth. But if you look at them uh, when they moor in an anchorage, you can you really don't see a very clear pattern. So we use this sort of information in the machine learning algorithm and alongside the, the AIS data to come up with this uh, identification results as you see in this very figure. So you can see that originally uh, there were quite a lot of, uh, most, you know, all of them are blue dots essentially, but now we are using CN and purple markers to represent those container ships, um, you know, um, waiting in the anchorage area. But while for all the other colors, uh, you know, representing those container ships docking at the berth. So we managed to do this identification results, uh, identification for all the major ports container, uh, sorry, for all the major container ports around the world. And uh, let me try to, sorry. Uh, so there was a, there's a, there's a hyperlink here, but we managed to do this for all the major container ports worldwide. So for Singapore, for Rotterdam, and also Ningbo Zhoushan, which is the second largest port in the world, we have all of them there. So feel free to revisit the paper later on. Um, so now we essentially have um, the geographical boundaries of those different port areas for all the major ports around the world. And then we have our essentially panel of the movements of container ships, the data. So now it's time to know, it's time to just, you know, go back to them and trying to figure out, you know, what is the ratio of a container ship that more in an anchorage area before talking at burst. So this is essentially how we define our congestion measure and later on to be used as a supply chain disruption measure. So uh, if you come, if you, if you uh, look at the right panel here, you can see that um, 
before I think before twenty uh, sorry before twenty twenty, essentially this theory is, uh, was fluctuating around this median sample median. Uh, I think it's around you know eighteen point one percent. But then just uh, before the pandemic, it actually dived down to to its historical uh, minimum before shooting up significantly. Um, to around 27% and then remain elevated thereafter. Um, so let me jump a slide to what our measure, how our measure compares to the GSCPI. So again, we are using the red lines to represent our measure, uh, while using the black dotted line to represent the GSCPI index by the New York Fed. You can clearly see there there are two key differences. Uh, the first absolute comes from this part where uh, the entire world was experiencing the first wave of the COVID. Um, so in the GSCPI, it had a very large jump, and then it didn't stay there for long before dying back down. So, you know, if we refer back to the paper by Julian Di Giovanni, they were saying that, um, you know, this jump was actually due to the initial Chinese lockdown. But then um, this decline was actually due to the partial reopening of China and Europe at that time. But if you compare their measure to ours, you can see that at least the port congestion was relatively, uh, it was still there at the historical low uh, minimum. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't really, ha we, didn't, we didn't really have a supply chain disruption at that time. And then the other difference comes from the later part of the sample, uh, where the GSCPI has predicted a, um, a decline, but our measure was still high there. So um, going back to the previous slide, what we are trying to argue in this paper, as I briefly alluded in the very beginning, was that um, the GSCPI was not necessarily an exogenous measure of global supply chain disruptions. And the reasons were clear because the endogeneity issue of transportation costs and measurement errors of the PMI. Uh, but for our measure, this ACR index, average congestion rate, we argue that it is very exogenous because due to the industry practice, it's very hard for those container ships to change their itineraries or routes. So that is to say, even you have demand changes around the world. For example, suddenly the states have very high demand for micro microconductors, uh, or in China, there were suddenly very high demands for, I don't know, um, something else. This sort of changes in demand will not alter the trajectory of those container ships traveled around the world. So anything, any, any, it, so anything that you see from port congestion, the rises, the falls, would come from supply side uh, alone. And also, since our measure is, uh, is a global measure, essentially, no matter there's a small change in the congestion rate for somewhere in the world, it will be averaged out uh, once we calculate this ACR index. And lastly, we are arguing that it, since it is using satellite data, it is accurate. So moving on to the second part of the paper, uh, which is using the um, which is using the theory to to get a set of uh, to get a set of identification restrictions. Uh, instead of going through the algebra and uh, mathematics, I just wanted to highlight two key features in the model. Uh, let's start from the second one, which is the endogenous separation of exporter importer matches on transportation cost. So that is essentially the very very example that I gave you a little bit earlier on my relationship with Francesco on exporting goods from Shanghai to Los Angeles. So that's the key. But uh, uh, in addition to that, we also have uh, search frictions on the international product market that, uh, you know, technically is to uh, is to allow us to have a different curvature of the supply curve, uh, which is going to be useful for the effect, you know, for the effect is effectiveness of monetary policy. Uh, Nevertheless, let me just show you the key uh, figure in our paper on the theoretical front. So what we managed to get from the model is a uh, aggregate supply curve as the following. It has a uh, steeper slope when we reach the essentially the uh, the bound of the uh, of the production. And then using this framework, we managed to get several um, uh, macro aggregates, notions of macro aggregates uh, in this picture. First of all, uh, in addition to the aggregate supply, we will have matching cost. We also have transportation cost. And adding them uh, together, we will have a notion of spare capacity. And in the model, it happens to be that the spare capacity is a, uh, essentially it, uh, it is equal to unemployment in the model's language. So that's uh, what we have in the, 
uh, from in the in the supply side of the economy. And if we augment the supply side of the economy with a very simple demand curve, we will have very interesting equilibrium dynamics that we can analyze to get this identification restrictions. For example, you know this one that I show on the slide, which is the equilibrium dynamics uh, following a demand sorry a demand shock. As you can see, uh, the demand will move to the left, and you have corresponding changes in prices, output, and so on and so forth. But more importantly, I wanted to go straight to this table where we summarize all these sign restrictions, which we will impose on RFs later on in the third part. So in particular, I wanted to highlight two parts. The first one is on price, the other one is on spare capacity. So start from the aggregate demand shock, I see. Uh, so you can see that when there is a negative demand shock, price will go down and unemployment will go up. So that's very intuitive. But then if you compare uh, between these two supply shock, so I think for most of the literature that right now, um, you know, online or whatever, uh, they are lo looking at labor supply shock directly. And most importantly, they will predict that, you know, there will be a, uh, once there's a labor supply shock, there will be decreasing output, but a increasing price. But in this paper, we actually say that it will have a decrease, sorry, a declining effect on unemployment as well. So the intuition is that uh, given, you know, if there's a labor supply shock, essentially the size of the pie becomes smaller. And then if you have to allocate this pie to, let's say, a set of households, then you will need to, you know, more, you know, workers need to uh, work a little bit more. So that's why our employment will go down. But this is not going to be the case if we look at supply chain disruption shock. So in addition to, uh, you know, a reduction in output and an increase in price, we actually predict an increase in our employment. So I think in most of the literature now, uh, people don't really distinguish between these two supply shocks. And uh, later on in the, in the SVR, uh, we will, I will show you this is very important. So given the interest of time, I'm just gonna go straight away to the comparison between our results and the result using GSCPI index. So which I believe it's more interesting. So on the left-hand panel here, you can see that this is the results using our uh, ACR index and the identification restrictions that I just so, show you in the previous table. So clearly I wanted to draw your attention to uh, this panel here, which is essentially the, uh, you know, the impact on inflation following a supply chain disruption shock. So I think this is consistent with some of most of the literature right now on the causal effects of supply chain disruption, because it clearly shows that it is inflationary uh, in this sense. And also you can see this as well for import price. But now if we just replace our index with the GSCPI from the New York Fed, you will not get this result. This is very clear from this second panel on the right hand side uh, of, this, uh, of this very slide. Actually, it is predicting, you know, it, uh, the response of uh, inflation was relatively muted in the very beginning, but then it dived back down uh, below zero after certain periods. And then this will have implications on um, for monetary policy because um, if we go to the historical decomposition of the United States, uh, inflation in the United States, on the left-hand side panel here, you can clearly see that our result is predicting a, uh, you know, the fall in inflation in the United States uh, in 2020 was, you know, was largely because of a, uh, uh, you know, a reduction in demand because, you know, that was the first wave of COVID swept, swept across the United States. But then you will not see this if we use the JCPI uh, as a alternative. And also more importantly, if we use the JCPI, we're actually predicting supply chain disruptions contributing negatively to inflation in the United States. So this is clearly uh, contradicting what we have in the theory part. And then for the remaining, I think I have two minutes? Two minutes, okay, I, I didn't even reach this far for all the previous uh, presentation that I gave. Uh, so let me just go through this with you. Um, so like I said in the very beginning, what we are interested in is whether the supply chain disruptions have altered the stabilization trade-off of monetary policy. So we, we do this into, into um, you know, parallel uh, ways. First of all, we use our, our model to, to, to grab some um, theoretical predictions. So in the model, we actually have this notion of uh, contraction monetary policy shock through a reduction in money supply. Uh, 
And then we'll also have this notion of supply chain disruption, which is essentially the distribution of transportation costs shifting to the right. And you can imagine that when the distribution of transportation costs shifting to the right, there will be more, uh, because, sorry, I didn't mention this in the model part, but if there is a given threshold, let's call it a reservation threshold of transportation cost, when you have the distribution to the right, then there is a higher probability of transportation costs, the straws of transportation cost going beyond that threshold, making the, uh, the trade uh, less profitable. So that's the mechanism we have in hand. But using our theory uh, and also some of the partial and uh, cross derivatives, we managed to show, uh, you know, these two figures. I wanted to draw your attention to the left panel here. So if there were no congestion, no global supply chain disruption, the economy will move from A to B. So uh, that's what will happen, uh, I think, pretty much before COVID. But now, if there were supply chain disruptions, the economy would from move from C to D. And if you compare the distance horizontally and vertically, you can clearly see that this trade-off has, uh, has changed. And that uh, was mostly driven by the shape of the supply curve um, in, our, in our model. So uh, nevertheless, the, the takeaway from the model part is that we predict that a contractual monetary policy shock could tame inflation at smaller costs of output and employment. And then what we wanted to do is to test whether this is the case using uh, a stretch, threshold VR model. And skipping all the details, uh, going to the very end, I'm going to show you this RFs. So you can clearly see that uh, if we use black and uh, black shaded area, black line and black shaded areas to represent the impulse responses functions for the periods of supply chain disruption, while those of the red ones representing those without supply chain disruptions. For example, looking at uh, real GDP, you can see that the reduction in real GDP uh, on impact was way much smaller during supply chain disruptions. And more importantly, if we look at GDP deflator or in import price, the responses of those price measures, they were greater in this uh, supply chain disruption, in these times of supply chain disruptions. And then also you can see something that has been predicted for unemployment as well. So let me conclude. Um, so what we wanted to answer in this very paper uh, are the causal effects and policy implications of supply chain disruptions for the US economy. So this might be a little bit different from what Dennis will show you a little bit later on. Uh, so in order to do this, we, we develop a new index, we construct a new theory, and essentially we combine these two parts into the state of the art of assessing causality in time series. So the three, uh, there are three main results. First of all, um, as you will know already, supply chain disruptions generate stagflation accompanied by an increase in spirit capacity. And the other one is that we cannot really get these results using uh, the fam famous measure uh, G GSCPI from the New York Fed. And then lastly is, uh, you know, the essentially the monetary policy, a uh, monetary policy, monetary tightening becomes a very much more powerful uh, than before. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now, Frank, you have 10 minutes. Well, it's, well, it's a it's a great pleasure to to be here. It's it's also great to be b back in this building. Brings back uh, the Eurotower. Brings back uh, nice memories. Um, thanks for the invitation to discuss uh, this paper. Uh, it's an excellent paper. And um, why is it an excellent paper? Because as as actually quite a number of papers in this this conference, it brings together new data with some new theory with some new empirical results and some policy uh, implications. And if I can get my slides on the back, then I can uh, continue. Um, so the, the, the new uh, measure, um, is it gonna come up? The new measure was, was uh, very much uh, explained uh, by Lee, and, and, and there's not much uh, I will uh, comment upon uh, there. I mean, it, it, it does show how sort of this new big data, including satellite data, can also be used in economics uh, to uh, measure uh, the concepts that we are uh, interested in. Uh, thank you. Um, 
So that's 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 a very nice uh, part uh, of, of 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 the paper. Um, uh, then there's a, a nice intuitive model uh, to analyze the effects of the rise in transportation costs, which has these two new features. There's a matching between exports and importers to model the congestion part, the spare capacity part. Uh, and then there is uh, an introduction of transportation costs, which really are treated as exogenous uh, and create this endogenous uh, separation. And, and the main purpose of this, this uh, model is to uh, provide identification restrictions. And again, uh, Lee mentioned uh, the, the particular restrictions. Um, and with those restrictions and this new measure of supply chain disruptions, uh, the authors find a very plausible uh, empirical finding that the congestion shock, if I may call it uh, so, is stagflationary, uh, and it accounts for a significant part of the rise in inflation, uh, particularly in 2021, uh, um, uh, so which is really the period when uh, you had this big rise in, or the period after you had this big rise in congestion. And then it has what I thought was quite an intriguing policy implication that monetary policy uh, in the model and in the data is uh, more effective when you do have those uh, supply uh, restrictions. Uh, so when the, the, the congestion is high, to my view, it's a little bit counterintuitive, particularly after having heard Gauti talk about how you need tight labor markets or tight markets to get you know, a, a steep Phillips curve. So it, 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 it is a, a somewhat different uh, intuition. So what I want to do in, in, in the rest of my uh, discussion is, is, is really talk a little bit about, I mean, basically give a number of smaller uh, comments. Um, I will not repeat uh, the, the definition of the average congestion uh, rate. I mean, just to, to, to tell you that, uh, and, and this picture was already shown, that this measure very much uh, correlates with uh, other measures of uh, transportation costs. Um, and so one suggestion will actually be, if you want to do a horse race, you should do part of the horse race with these other me measures of, of transportation costs, rather than, I would say, with this, uh, the New York Fed's uh, global supply chain uh, uh, pressure index, which of course is a broader uh, index of uh, supply uh, pressures. Um, so three comments on 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 the measure. Uh, so it's 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 actually a very specific uh, example of global supply chain. It's it's really this congestion. So it it correlates very high with transportation uh, costs. And of course, one one can can have other definitions uh, of supply chain uh, pressures. I mean, one one example which would also be very specific was the supply of microchips. I mean, we know that there was a problem. This was not only associated with uh, congestion in world uh, ports, uh, but of course it also had big impacts in the global uh, supply network. I mean, the time series is quite short uh, and, and you start, I guess, uh, you have to, to end the sample somewhere uh, with a sample which ends in, in July 22. This is when this congestion index is, is still very high. And so from the picture you see, you basically have almost a step function. It's, it's low and then it increases a lot and stays there. Now, since July 22, this has come back again. And so I think to, to robustify your results and probably also get uh, more uh, significant uh, results, I would, would extend the sample and also use the information that comes from the big drop in, in, in congestion. In the paper, a big uh, point is made about uh, this this measure being exogenous, and uh, I mean, I take the point that it is sort of more exogenous than, say, a measure of of transportation uh, prices. Um, but I think it would be good to to also show some evidence that, for example, is this uh, indicator also cyclical uh, or not? Uh, uh, do you, I mean some of the lockdown measures do they correlate? Uh, with this congestion in the ports, because a lot of congestion had also to do with labor supply uh, in the ports. Um, and uh, I mean, your argument for why it is exogenous, I mean, it's not completely convincing because let's say if global trade is booming, 
then actually there will be more ships being planned. And so if there's more ships coming into ports, then for sure your measure, which is sort of the share of ships that are ships that are in anchoring places versus the total calls is likely to be higher. So th there could be some, some, some cyclical component there. And to some extent, you see that a little bit in the VR recently. Um, okay, so, so this is uh, just uh, to, to because, uh, as an illustration of these three, these three points. I mean, th these are sort of the supply chain pressure heat map that we use uh, 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 at the ECB. The transportation costs are, are, are in this lower part. I mean, depending on, on which one you use, you can actually have quite uh, different numbers. So for example, the freight uh, uh, transportation cost index, which is the, the the last, the, the third last uh, column, that peaked actually very early. And so the, the GSCPI probably picks up some of those those things uh, too. Um, okay, let me then go, it, it's a very nice intuitive model. Um, I think I, I will not repeat uh, the type of sign restrictions that come uh, out of it. I think it, it's, it's quite intuitive that transportation costs, they work like a uh, negative supply shock, uh, but they have this different from labor supply shocks. They have this uh, different effect on, uh, on 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 unemployment or on on capacity. So the fact that transportation costs change doesn't change the uh, capacity to produce uh, at, uh, at at home. Of course, this will depend to a large extent on how you measure capacity. If, if capacity is is taken from the importer's side, actually, it will also be. Uh, uh, affected by, by this model. Um, okay, the, the first point I, I already uh, uh, made, um, uh, I'm not sure why you have these zero restrictions. I don't think you probably need them. And, and sort of they are a bit annoying because the, the paper flows very nicely from the data to the theory to the restrictions. And then you add these zero restrictions, which, which, which I don't think probably you don't, uh, you don't need. Uh, I mean, the model, of course, cannot capture the inflation persistence. It's actually a model of the price, price level. Um, uh, and, and so uh, if you want to talk about inflation persistence, you probably need to have a real supply uh, chain network. Uh, you will need to have some, some, some price stickiness uh, at the different modes and so on and so forth. One minute. Um, and then the third, and this is very cheap. Uh, I, I was, I mean, it is a very nice model, and it's a quite intuitive model, and uh, but it's also not an easy uh, uh, model. Um, I was thinking uh, Gauti's model of this morning, which is also not that uh, simple, but probably it can give you similar sign restrictions if you if the difference is really between a general demand shock, a labor supply shock, and a sort of imported input shock, which transportation costs uh, uh, is one example of, then probably you get the same uh, same sort of sign restrictions. On the uh, plausible empirical results, uh, maybe let me just uh, say that um, the responses of the, uh, the, uh, the new index uh, the average congestion rate, they're very similar to the responses of import prices. Uh, actually, I think I, I showed. So, so this is for each of the three shocks. On the left-hand side, you have the response of import prices. On the right-hand side, you have the response of the ACR. So I'm not sure there's actually that much different information in those two series, at least for this uh, sample. And I was wondering whether, why, if, if ACR is, is quite exogenous, why can't you use it just as an instrument for the imported uh, price uh, shock, uh, because then generalizes the set of, of, of results that you can get. And let me then just uh, end with uh, the last slide, with the intriguing monetary policy finding. Again, I think it's intriguing because it's the opposite of what one would uh, intuitively think, uh, definitely having listened to, to Gauti this morning. Price effects are larger when the market is tight. In this case, price, that was in, in Gauti's. In this case, price effects are larger when there's quite a bit of slack. And and I think, I'm, I'm not sure I fully got the intuition. So but that's probably more, more my, my mistake. So very nice, uh, excellent work. Thanks.
Thanks, Frank. So maybe you have some question for the audience and then you can answer Frank and, and also question. Yeah. And and please identify yourself and the microphone. Um, Michael Lenz from DCB. So I also thought this was a great paper. I just have one question on the monetary policy implication. So when I look at the input response function, I also noticed that in the two different scenarios, the response of the federal funds rate is very different. Now that can be because the endogenous variable behave differently, but the policy rule is the same, but it could also be that there is a different policy rule in the, in the uh, two different scenarios. So that would, uh, you know, probably then could also explain a part of the difference in the other variable and not be only related to this uh, difference in supply curves. Thank you, Katya Penava from the Federal Reserve Board. So I had my first question was, how is your measure? And I understand how it is constructed differently, but in terms of how, how are the implications of your measure different from the vessel schedule availability or the number of seaborne containers? These are measures people have been looking now. Uh, I, I mean, they've existed for a while, but we really have been looking at them the last two, three years. So, um, other than differently constructed, what, what what other things does your measure bias over these alternative um, container measures? And um, in terms of um, studying the implications uh, for inflation and monetary policy, I wonder if it might not be better to 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 focus your measure more narrowly for goods prices because if that's where you are hitting the really steep non-linear part of the supply curve that's when you know even a little bit of a reduction in demand from monetary policy tightening can get you a, a big decline in inflation rather than just overall inflation or GDP because these are containers you know, not, not used, I'm guessing, for oil, and uh, unless you're including those, and they are not also used to transport services, right? So you can just focus it more narrowly. That's, that's it. Thanks. Maybe you can answer this question, and then we can see if we can move it. Great. Thank you, first of all. Thank you so much, Frank, um, for giving this um, discussion on this paper. Uh, I find uh, all of the comments very, very, very informative, and uh, I wanted to just talk about some of them. Um, I may not be able to note down all of them, but uh, uh, there are several. So the first thing is about the exogeneity of our measure, and also that speaks to uh, your question um, just a little bit earlier. Uh, we actually start from this um, industrial practice because um, by talking to one of my co you know, she just told me that the schedules of those container ships, they will not be affected by changes in demand. So, um, as put by a, uh, you know, Milt, uh, sorry, uh, Julia Brancasio from New York University in their very famous Econometrica paper. Um, so, she mentioned that those container ships, they were very much like buses on the sea. So, the don't really change a lot in terms of their behaviors. So that's why by looking at their behaviors uh, and also examining them, we actually have a supply measure instead of a convolution of supply and demand. So that's initially, uh, in essentially, you know, how we get this exogeneity and why we wanted to emphasize that uh, in the paper. Uh, but uh, I understand that there were some changes in, you know, the shipping capacity across routes during the COVID period. Um, and in particular, there's an example uh, for some companies changing, you know, actually shifting some capacity from the Asia Africa route to uh, Asia United States uh, North America route. So there, there have been some changes, uh, but in the paper, we did several robustness checks to rule out this, um, uh, you know, this effects of this sort of things, changing capacity, for example, on the ACR and also the causal effects uh, of global supply chain disruptions. Uh, without going into the detail, we actually find all the results are still robust. Uh, so this is the first thing. The second thing is on the intuition on why we actually find a, 
uh, more effective monetary tightening during periods of supply chain disruption and why this is going against uh, what Gotti has mentioned in the beginning. I think it is focusing. So let me explain uh, our intuition. So it is actually very simple because when you have a uh, when you, when you have a much steeper slope of the aggregate supply curve as we have in our model, um, that essentially changes the sensitivity of prices to uh, movements in demand. And then this changes in the sensitivity will then translate, translate into changes in the effectiveness of monetary policy, because in our uh, model, it is very simple. It's coming directly from a reduction in money supply. It's essentially playing the same role as a contractionary demand shock from other sources. Um, so I don't, and then on the second thing, I don't really have a very good answer on why our result is kind of different from Gossi's, uh, but I would have, would love to highlight that, you know, we are actually looking at the exports and imports, this trade framework, instead of the labor market. I think if you, you know, maybe focusing one or the other, you will get completely different results. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, this is uh, my comments. But then there's one, um, um, there's another comment on the RNFs of FFR uh, in the last part of our paper, whether that is that may be due to, for example, changes in the policy rules or something else. Uh, that was a very good question. We actually, you know, we were actually doing something uh, to, 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 as a robustness check. So in particular, we were actually using a, a method by Sophocles on uh, implementing zero lower bound in the structural ARs because we know that uh, during the post-COVID period, there were actually a very long period of uh, uh, very close to zero in, uh, interest rates in the United States. So we wanted to tear that out using this new method. We're still working on it, uh, hence the results are not so clear at the moment. Um, and then lastly, uh, a very also a very good suggestion on re using the um, the you know the instead of using the GDP deflator, we we can use the prices on the goods. So we will have a look at that as a robustness check in the paper. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gillian. Uh, so now we should probably move to the next presentation. So Dennis uh, Bonham is going to present us global supply chain pressure, inflation, and implication for monetary policy. You have twenty five uh, minutes. Right. <clears throat> Let me start by thanking uh, the organizers for uh, putting uh, the paper uh, on this uh, very great uh, program. So this is joint work with uh, Guido Ascari and Andras Madu, uh, colleagues from the Dutch Central Bank. Uh, so uh, you know the usual disclaimer applies. Um, I want to start with this uh, figure, which shows the uh, global supply chain pressure index uh, from the New York Fed, which uh, Lee has uh, spent some time bashing and uh, being very critical about. So. Just going to ask you to forget what he said for the next 20 minutes. Um, so, and then in red, we have your area core inflation. Uh, so, what, yeah, what you can see is that in the past 20 years or so, uh, there have been these spikes in global supply chain pressures due to various reasons. We had the GFC, uh, natural disasters in Japan, and of course the the, the run up uh, during uh, during COVID in different ways. Um, and then if you apply some uh, eyeballing econometrics, you can also see that inflation and these global supply chain pressures seem to kind of co-move, albeit that you know, uh, inflation is, uh, comes with a lag a bit. So we have these global supply uh, chain shocks, these spikes. Uh, at the same time, um, global value chains are very relevant for a lot of advanced economies. So I show you here one of the many measures that you can think of of global value chain participation uh, in a bunch of advanced economies, and you see that they are quite uh, large, uh, quite substantial, have been trending upwards until the GFC, and then started to level off, but not really have been going down, right? So uh, at least from this uh, perspective, there's no, no risk of a, a deglobalization. In, in fact, in my own country, uh, we still seem to rely more and more on global, uh, global value chains. So given the importance of these spikes, these shocks to global supply chain pressures, and also given the importance of global value chains in advanced economies, what we want to know in this, this paper is, what we ask is, how much do these global supply chain pressures contribute to inflation in the euro area? Um, and we're going to do uh, this empirically 
in, uh, in two ways. We're going to start off with a, a very simple Phillips curve analysis. And then we also have a, a more structural approach where we use a BVAR. And then secondly, in the theoretical part of the paper, we want to know what these global supply chain pressure shocks, uh, what they imply for optimal monetary policy. And to this end, we, uh, we're going to use a new Keynesian model for two countries uh, that features in a very stylized way uh, global supply chains. And what we find uh, in a nutshell is that the global supply chain pressures contribute positively and significantly to inflation in the euro area. So this is what we find from the Phillips curve analysis. And the BVAR is going to tell us that shocks to these uh, supply chain pressures were the dominant driver of inflation um, in 2022 and also have a highly uh, persistent and hum-shaped effect on inflation. Now, the model, the new Keynesian model is going to tell us that the optimal response to this type of shock that raises inflation is going for monetary policy to tighten. However, the, this, the aggressiveness of this tightening is going to be a nonlinear function of how much a country relies on global value change. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip this, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this slide, but, you know, suffice to say that there are a lot of papers that are related to this topic, and it, it seems that every week I, I find another paper that is written on, on this. Okay, so uh, starting with the empirical part of the paper, like I said, uh, we take a two-pronged approach. We start off with a Phillips curve analysis, and then we have a BVAR, and then the Phillips curve analysis is going to be very simple. So we have... You know, for the euro area, we're going to regress inflation on its lags, some measure of slack expectations. That's going to be our baseline Phillips curve. And then we're going to compare this with an augmented Phillips curve that where we add the GSCPI as an additional regressor and see what happens. Okay. So this is our, these are the results. Um, so we're going to use monthly data. So we use industrial production as our slack measure. And as you can see um, in columns three and four, the coefficient on this GCPI is positive and, and, and significant. Um, we're not going to claim any causality here. This is just, you know, uh, for illustration, basically. Uh, but it does suggest that there is some positive co-movement between these global supply chain pressures and, and euro area inflation. Now, another noticeable result was that, you know, if you look at the estimate for the slope of the Phillips curve, which is the top row, and you compare, you know, the, the baseline model with the augmented model, this slope is is, is quite big, uh, a bit larger than. Um, uh, when you include the GCPI uh, measure. So, you know, this gives you some indication that by adding some external factor in your Phillips curve, this helps you to better identify uh, uh, the Phillips curve slope and, you know, helps you avoid uh, uh, finding a fl flat Phillips curve. Then over to the, to the BVAR. <clears throat> so again, we give you a monthly uh, data. Uh, we're going to use six variables, five aggregate variables, so these are industrial production, core inflation, uh, the 10-year OS rate to capture the monetary stance, real effect exchange rate, and energy prices, and we're going to add the uh, GSCPI. So we're going to uh, impose a number of restrictions, sign restrictions, zero restrictions. Um, we have demand shocks that, you know, that are very standard in the sense that they move output and prices and the interest rates in the same direction. And then we have domestic and global supply uh, shocks. Um, and here, the, the way we try to distinguish between the two is to impose that the domestic supply shock has no contemporaneous impact on the GCPI, whereas global supply shocks you know, uh, lead to an increase in the GCPI on impact. And then we have a bunch of other uh, shocks that we want to uh, identify in order to kind of build a narrative on the relative importance of these shocks. So in addition to these sign and zero restrictions, we also impose narrative restrictions. Um, so we have four. Um, first, we're going to impose that demand shocks have a negative sign in uh, March and April of 2020 to capture the effects of the pandemic. Then uh, we're going to impose that uh, the global supply chain pressure shocks will have a positive sign in uh, March 2011. So this is to capture the, um, the, the earthquake in Japan. Relatedly, uh, we're going to say that in March 2011, in April uh, 2020 and 21, November 21, the contribution of um, global supply chain pressure shocks to the GCPI uh, forecast errors are, are the biggest, are the, uh, are the biggest. And then finally, uh, we're going to impose that the uh, monetary policy shocks are the main drivers of uh, the forecast errors of the 10-year OIS rate in January 2015 to capture the announcement of the APP. 
Okay. So this this is the this is what comes out of the the B var, uh, and yeah, you can immediately see that uh, in green, this is our identified global supply and gene pressure shock, is quite prominent. Uh, is a quite prominent driver of, of inflation dynamics. Before the crisis, that um, you know, uh, consistent with what we saw in the beginning of this increasing uh, participation in global value chains, these favorable global supply shocks that were weighing on inflation. And then during the global financial crisis, um, there was this unwinding of, 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 of uh, global supply chains and these shocks uh, had a positive impact on, on inflation. And then if you move forward to the pandemic, you see that um, you know, around uh, 2021, 2022, these global supply chain pressure shocks uh, were the dominant driver of, uh, of, of, of euro area inflation. Um, also, of course, with some contribution from demand and from energy price shocks. Um, but uh, I, I, I remember, if I remember correctly, the, the, the global supply chain pressure shocks can explain a roughly 40% in the end of 2022. Now, if you look at the impulse responses uh, of euro area inflation to this global supply chain pressure shock on the left and domestic uh, supply shocks on the right, we see that uh, although inflation responds positively to this um, domestic supply shock, the response is quite short-lived, right? Whereas if you look at the response to the global supply shock, um, we see a much more persistent and hump-shaped uh, response. Now, we don't delve into this uh, very deeply in the, in the paper, but we conjecture that this is about, you know, things like second round effects, um, the fact that firms might not be able to switch to uh, or set up new global uh, gl supply chains in the short run at, in the short run at low cost so you get this accumulation of 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 of, of, uh, of effects that uh, cause these shocks to kind of move gradually to the rest of the economy so to sum up the the imp empirical uh, results um, as i said the the, the Phillips curve analysis um, kind of shows or illustrates that global su global supply chain pressures contribute positively and significantly to your area inflation, and the BFAR model tells us that the, the shocks to this, uh, to these types of uh, uh, global supply chain pressures were the dominant driver of your area inflation in 2022, and also have a very highly persistent and hump-shaped impact on inflation. Um, okay, so now to the theoretical part of the paper. As I mentioned, we're gonna use a um, new Keynesian model for two countries, um, we have home and foreign. <coughs> The model is very simple, uh, very plain vanilla. So it's, it's like uh, the paper from uh, Benigno 2009. We have households, you know, they consume, they save, they work. They consume both home and foreign goods and they hold both home and foreign assets. And whenever they, they, they have uh, uh, foreign assets, they, they face a, a risk premium. Then we have two types of firms. We have intermediate good firms that are perfectly competitive. So they set price equal to marginal cost. And then we have final good firms that are price setters, uh, but they face like a price adjustment cost, uh, a la Rottenberg. And this is the bit where it gets uh, a little bit uh, uh, non plain vanilla. But uh, the, so the final goods firm, um, uh, final goods are produced using both home and foreign intermediate goods. So there is trade and intermediate inputs, and this gives rise to this, um, this global supply chains, basically. So let me give you a bit more detail. So this is from the perspective of the home country. So there's in the home country, there's an intermediate goods firm that produces intermediate good X. Z A is a productivity shock, N is, is hours worked. And then the final good in, in, in home, so YH, is going to be a composite of uh, this home intermediate good uh, and, uh, and this foreign intermediate good, right? So uh, X, H, uh, X, H, and XF where phi is gonna be the elasticity of substitution between these home and foreign intermediate goods. Now, gamma is gonna be um, our parameter of interest. This is gonna measure the, the share of foreign intermediate goods used in the production of home final goods. Uh, and this is gonna you know, give you a sense of how much this country relies on global value change. So what does this imply when this gamma is greater than zero? It's going to imply that uh, domestic marginal costs are going to be directly influenced by changes in foreign prices or foreign productivity shocks, so ZA star, right? So there's going to be this additional cost channel um, that causes shocks to uh, uh, causes foreign supply shocks to immediately feed into uh, domestic uh, uh, costs, marginal costs. 
So how do we model global supply chain pressures? Um, well, again, like I said, set, basically setting gamma greater to zero implies that this economy relies on global value chains. The higher is gamma, the more the country relies on global value chains. Now, we're going to proxy global supply chain pressures using this foreign productivity shock, ZA star. Right? So if there's a drop in ZA star, it means there, is less, there are less uh, uh, foreign intermediate goods uh, inputs available for the production of home goods. So we get these uh, global supply chain snarls. And of course, um, uh, how big these pressures are, uh, are going to be depends on how large gamma is. Right? OK, so these are the uh, impulse responses um, for selection of home variables to this global supply chain pressure shock, right? So this negative foreign uh, productivity shock for different uh, values of this gamma. The solid line is the case where uh, gamma is zero. And as you can see, in this case, this shock kind of looks like a demand shock in the sense that both output and inflation go up. And um, kind of the story behind this is that, you know, if there is a foreign supply shock, foreign price go up, then there's this strong um, um, uh, expenditure switching effect uh, that causes an increase in the demand for home goods. So home output rises and, and inflation rises, and then the central bank tightens and consumption falls. But if gamma is positive, right, and so the country relies on global value chains, then we see that this shock acts like a supply shock. So output falls and inflation rises. So the idea here is that, you know, as, as foreign goods become more expensive, in, there is going to be an increase in, in domestic marginal costs as home firms are reliant on foreign intermediate inputs. And so this will lead to a reduction in demand for home goods, um, but there will be an increase in inflation, uh, uh, more so even than in the case where um, this country was not exposed to, to, uh, to uh, supply chain uh, disruptions. Right, so this is basically what I just, uh, just mentioned. Now, because the, 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 the reliance on global value chains makes this global uh, supply shock, uh, um, uh, turns it into a more classical supply shock, you also have this classical trade-off for monetary policy between stabilizing output and prices, right? And this trade-off depends on gamma. So the higher is gamma, right? So if the economy is faced with a global supply chain pressure shock, the higher is gamma, the higher is going to be the scarce channel and so the greater will be the rise in inflation and the drop in output, right? So if a country relies more on, uh, uh, on global value chains, the trade-off for monetary policy between stabilizing output and, 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 and inflation is going to be less favorable. Okay, so how should monetary policy respond to, these, uh, to this global supply shock? So here I plot again the uh, impulse responses of selection of home variables. Um, for the case where gamma is set to 0.3, which is kind of consistent with the second figure I showed in the beginning. The red dashed uh, lines are the ones under a standard Taylor rule. So these are the ones that you already saw. And the blue lines are, are the ones under Ramsey optimal policy. And as you can see, uh, optimal policy kind of implies that um, the central bank should favor stabilizing inflation over output. Um, so output uh, drops uh, by more than under a standard Taylor rule, but inflation is uh, roughly stabilized. Now, it turns out that the optimal uh, response to this global supply shock also depends on this gamma. Um, so here I plot both the impact peak and cumulative response of the home policy interest rate to a global supply shock on the Ramsey optimal policy for different measures of gamma. And as you can see, up until a, a certain threshold, if you increase gamma, this response should be more aggressive, right? So you, you should tighten uh, more aggressively in response to this global supply shock. Why? Because as gamma is, is higher, this economy is going to be more exposed to uh, foreign supply shocks, uh, and, and therefore you want to you know, respond by taming, taming the, the, the resulting uh, uh, higher inflation. But if gamma exceeds this, uh, goes beyond this threshold, then we have that this trade-off between output and, uh, and inflation stabilization becomes worse and worse, and so uh, Ramsey optimal policy calls for a less aggressive uh, uh, policy uh, reaction. Now, of course, this uh, also depends on a lot of other parameters in the model. Here I look at different values for uh, this phi, which is, remember, this is uh, elasticity of substitution between home and foreign intermediate goods. 
And essentially, if you increase this elasticity, it simply means that, you know, uh, substituting away from foreign intermediate goods towards home intermediate goods becomes easier. And this helps to kind of absorb the adverse effects of a global supply shock, right? And this allows for a more aggressive monetary policy response. The same holds when I uh, vary uh, ETA. I haven't shown ETA, but ETA is the uh, elasticity of substitution between home and foreign final goods, and we get a similar, um, similar result. However, if I then change the degree of price stickiness, um, then what we find is that the more sticky our prices, the greater will become, you know, uh, the output costs of a of a, uh, a foreign supply shock, global supply shock, and this will e worsen even more the trade off between output and inflation stabilization. So this calls for a much less uh, aggressive monetary policy response. Okay, so just to sum up the theoretical results, um, what we find is that you know, if a country relies on global value change, so gamma is positive, then a global supply chain pressure shock acts like a classical supply shock uh, in the sense that it raises inflation and reduces output. And the higher is this gamma, the, the worse this trade-off becomes. Um, we find that Ramsey optimal policy implies a tightening of monetary policy in response to this type of shock, although this, this, the aggressiveness of this tightening depends in a nonlinear way on different types of parameters. So uh, the gamma, uh, but also other parameters like the substitution of elasticity and uh, the degree of price thickness. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm done, this space. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Now, any nice one, I have five, 10 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, yeah, the usual uh, disclaimer applies that these are my views. So let me get uh, straight to the point by saying that uh, I found the paper very topical and interesting. And uh, as you saw, the paper is the aim of the paper is twofold. First, to measure the impact of supply side bottlenecks on euro area inflation, and then to derive some lessons for central bankers. How should they respond to such shocks? So the authors, uh, the authors basically find that these shocks are extremely important for euro area inflation, but they also make the, the, the job of the central bankers more difficult as uh, they worsen the inflation output trade-off. So why do I say that the, the paper is very topical? So as you all know, uh, now basically this particular type of shock uh, related to global supply chain issues have has been in the spotlight since the pandemic now. So um, we've been talking about it now in uh, also in, um, in uh, central bankers world, in uh, policy makers circles, and also in the academia, you've seen more and more papers on that. But it's also the consumer, so the public at large, that has come to understand how important these shocks really are for inflation. So here you have some recent evidence from the New York Fed survey of consumer expectations where um, the number one driver of the recent uh, surge in inflation in the post-pandemic world was identified to be actually issues related to supply chain issues. So indeed, it's something that we have to understand more about. And, um, and this is why the papers that we've seen now in this session are so important. But in my view, what I think the papers should stress more is actually um, the uncertainty related to our understanding when it comes to the effects of this shock. So I will refer to, to three aspects. So of course, proxying supply chain pressures, identifying the shocks related to them, and also how we deal with the challenges that post-pandemic data are, are bringing. So um, the first things that I thought about when reading the paper was related to proxying the supply chain pressures. And I think this came out very clearly from this session and also from the first presentation. So basically we are talking about a very complex phenomenon, multifaceted. So we are, we are talking about um, problems in transportation due to COVID induced lockdowns or to demand rising much faster than supply could accommodate or even some idiosyncratic weather events 
So when incorporating such a phenomenon in your models, we have to take a shortcut now. So we have to use some kind of proxy. This paper is using the GSEPI now, so this composite indicator that is focusing basically on supply uh, components. But we've also seen uh, other papers are using different proxies. So we've seen the, the, the paper today using satellite data on congestion at container ports. But the literature is still now ongoing and people are looking for, let's say, the perfect proxy. So Planchard and Bernanke are using an index of supply chain problems based on Google searches or um, some very recent work on using indices based on newspaper data uh, that um, is uh, out just yet. So let me just compare. Uh, you've seen basically that GSEPI gives different messages to other proxies. And this has major implications in our uh, assessment. And here I'm comparing it to this index used by Blanchard and Bernanke, this Google Trend Shortage Index. And you see that while the measures are correlated, the spikes do not necessarily coincide. And the times they also give us divergent messages. And for us practitioners, of course, this is very important when we want to provide some timely um, information to our policymakers. So uh, I think uh, when talking about this new type of shocks, robustness checks are in place now. And I wanted to ask whether you've considered looking at other indices. Second uh, type and source of uncertainty is linked to the identification of shocks. And of course, we know in this literature that, of course, we, we choose uh, sign and zero restrictions. But in this particular literature, we also have narrative restrictions that are being more and more used and more frequently, let's say, to pin down the specific shocks. And they relate to um, specific uh, historical events. So here I'm comparing the discussed paper uh, in the third column with two other papers dealing with a similar topic. And you see that the historical events that were chosen to pin down this particular shock differ. So for instance, uh, actually the Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011 is basically used by all three papers to pin down this shock, but other events are used differently. So of course there is also a subjective element, but it would be interesting to know how did you choose the, uh, the historical events to pin down the shocks and how would the shocks look like if we would uh, be broader, let's say, in the, the, the number of events that we would uh, use to, to pin it down. And, and apart from this, the restrictions that are used in the SVAR literature, I think another source of uncertainty related to that that came out even more prominently after the pandemic is related to the number of identified shocks. Uh, why do I say that? And why perhaps even more relevant after the pandemic? Because while we were trying to answer actually similar questions so the, as uh, Dennis and co-authors, we realized that when trying to explain this abnormal inflation surge, uh, when many indicators had this prolonged spike you would see some kind of a spurious correlation that would give you a... If you don't control for enough uh, sources of shocks of inflationary drivers, would give you a larger contribution from a specific shock than one should actually attribute. So imagine GSCPI and inflation rising very fast at the same time. Uh, without controlling for different, let's say, um, energy uh, pressures, uh, you would have more coming from GSCPI than you would want. And, and this is driven by this really abnormal spike. So in a, in a model that we identify in a, a bit of a different way, so uh, it's a larger model that we identified via the Corobilis uh, algorithm where basically reduced form uh, errors are assumed to have a factor structure. We, we stop at, uh, at eight shocks, uh, going further to nine or 10 would give us something similar. And we saw that the contribution of the GSCPI or like um, supply chain pressures, the green part, so this, uh, this green part is the same in the two papers, namely contributions from global supply chain pressures is smaller when you control for more shocks or, or I don't know. So this was the question for the authors, if you thought about uh, adding one more shock or if you saw that this actually changes. I've seen a, a preliminary version of the paper without energy shocks now, and I think there it was definitely different.
Uh, and actually, you uh, know, this number of identified shocks is still something that is quite ad hoc in this literature, so it's, uh, it's a choice. And uh, the third uh, point that I wanted to make is related to the uncertainty linked to the abnormal post-pandemic data. And here I don't refer to these outliers, the strong outliers that were dealt with, let's say, by uh, Lenza and Trimiceri or by Carriero et al. I'm talking about this prolonged spike in inflation, uh, concomitant with the prolonged spike in other economic indicators that would give us a significant pass-through of shocks that we didn't manage to get before. So now we see that uh, some shocks matter and with pre-pandemic data, we couldn't find much significance. So uh, the authors as augment basically a Phillips curve with the GCPI indicator and they find a significant and strong uh, coefficient. So trying to, to replicate this uh, basically in a similar kind of Phillips curve, I wanted to see how such a coefficient would evolve over time. And basically what I got was that for the entire Euro area sample before the pandemic, the coefficient was very close to zero with little movement. It is only when adding this uh, post pandemic uh, observations that you get some significant effect coming from that. And this is a smooth estimate of a time varying model in a filtered one, you would see even clearer. But in a way, it is it is basically a judgment call. No, it's a stance to make uh, which sample you want to use. And Blanchard and Bernanke very nicely put it, and they take the, a stance in the recent paper by saying, in order to include meaningful variation in the effects of sectoral shortages, we estimate the baseline price equation over the full sample. Why exactly to get this effect of the short uh, sectoral shortages in? But it also shows us how difficult it is actually to pin down the sources of inflation in real time. Exposed, of course, uh, things look a bit more clear, but in real time things are very difficult. So uh, I don't know if uh, you also uh, observed some, some instabilities over uh, estimating on different uh, samples. So uh, let me wrap up a very relevant paper and it stresses now that in this deeply connected world, we have to take uh, more seriously external factors uh, when uh, modeling inflation, such as problems along the production chain. So it's basically along the lines of a paper by Christine Forbes in 2019, when she was saying that uh, our models are basically putting a very strong emphasis on, uh, on domestic drivers. And uh, also, actually, it is uh, not so trivial. Uh, it's not easy how to pin down the impact of these shocks, especially in real time. Uh, but our central, uh, our, our policy makers actually have to ha take decisions now in real time. And, and what the authors also nicely show is that the optimal reaction to the supply chain bottleneck shocks depend on the integration in the global value chains in a non-linear manner. No? So the more integrated, actually the less aggressive you have to react due to the worsens of this inflation output trade-off. And, and that, this actually only adds to the challenges uh, faced by the policymakers. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Um, Maybe we can take a couple of questions and then, like, uh, if there is some. Yep. Uh, uh, please, again, identify yourself. Hi, this is Catalina Martinez Hernandez from the ECB. Um, so I was a little bit surprised to see that the, the contribution of the of the global supply chain shock was uh, very large um, in the low inflation period. So I was wondering if you can give us a little bit more intuition why is this the case? Um, and also something in line with what Elena was uh, saying, um, maybe one shock that is uh, missing to explain also this period is uh, shocks related to the labor market. So I was wondering if you were also considering as a further robustness. Thank you. Probably a question for you, but also it applied to the previous paper. I mean, when thinking about global value chains, I thought we, I would have heard the word exchange rate much more often, um, meaning the exchange, especially since I think of us as a global shock. We also had an old literature on global value chains that to do with global slack and how world demand affects in general the slope of the Phillips curve, not just with the domestic output, but also the global one. 
but neither of you mentioned neither the exchange rate as part of the Ramsey policy or not, nor the extent to which global slack. And going back also to the discussion on how the slope has changed, I mean, this was a global supply shock at the world level as opposed to an individual country. I would think that would matter somewhat. So if you could say something about the exchange rate and global slack, I think that would be helpful. Maybe you can answer. So uh, first of all, thanks, Elena, for your uh, very nice discussion. Um, yeah, so you had three points. First, on the uncertainty on uh, the proxy for the supply chain pressures. Um, I think uh, uh, Lee's presentation was all about this, um, and uh, the point is well taken. Um, it is on our to-do list to also consider uh, other measures of, uh, of global supply chain pressures, including, uh, indeed, uh, the Benanki Blanchard uh, uh, indicator uh, so this is something that we definitely need to, to pick up as well as um, on your second point the uncertainty on the uh, identification um, adding more shocks uh, so we recently added the energy uh, shock and, and that that already uh, changed somewhat the results um, um, quantitatively um, yeah we are we're also going to uh, you know Think about other kind of restrictions, trying to use, for instance, the war in Ukraine um, uh, for to identify the energy shock, for instance. Um, the use of post uh, uh, COVID data also uh, kind of complicates things, but as you also uh, showed, it's perhaps necessary to, to you know, uh, uh, to properly identify the shock, you know, leaving out COVID uh, and, if the, and these extreme events uh may leave you to you know uh, have a very uh, kind of unmeaningful uh, uh, effects um but we can definitely also emphasize this more in the paper mm. yes then um catalina's uh, question um so the low inflation period we do do and see uh, indeed see uh, um, some um uh, some impact uh, from um, this global supply chain pressure shocks. Let me think. Um, yeah, so this is so we we have we, we kind of relate so our narrative is basically related to um, the figure that I showed in the beginning on the development of global uh, value chain participation. So before the global financial crisis, we saw this increase in participation um, that we link to uh more favorable global supply chain pressures um that put downward pressure on inflation and then as um uh, following the global financial crisis um firms started to uh, reconsider their global value chains um uh, and, and and some of these uh, uh, global value chains started to unravel um there are more and more uh, uh, positive contributions uh, for the global value um, change shocks on inflation uh, but I also have to admit, I was also surprised that um, um, this, uh, uh, these contributions are so large, basically. Uh, although, although they, they do somehow uh, fit into a, a Forbes uh, paper that shows that, you know, you need kind of um, um, external factors that can explain why perhaps monetary policy has been so, uh, uh, why it has been so difficult to, to kind of control inflation during that, that period uh, because of these offsetting effects. Um, and yeah, on your labor market shocks, uh, that's a good idea. I mean, I haven't thought about it, but uh, it would be would be interesting too. I mean, we have a monthly uh, model, but yeah, it would be nice to if we somehow can can also uh, incorporate labor market shocks. And on Ricardo's question, um, so we yeah we do identify also real exchange rate shocks um, in the BFAR model, and in uh, the new Keynesian model, we also spend a little bit of time also mentioning that this additional cost channel that arises because of these global value chains um, gives an additional role kind of for the real exchange rate on um, uh, uh, for domestic marginal cost basically. So that, that that already is there in the Phillips curve if you have an open economy model, but this gives you an, an additional uh, channel basically. Um, I don't know if Lee also wants to kind of comment on this. Uh... Yes, so thank you Ricardo for the question. Uh, I have to say that was a fantastic one because in a very, very preliminary version of this paper, we actually have exchange rate and BOP stuff in the SVR. Uh, but it's just because um, for the simple model that we built to uh, to get those identification restrictions, we really don't have a, a part on exchange rate. So essentially we have to let the exchange rate uh, 
unrestricted in the SVR estimation. And as can, as can imagine in terms of the SVRs, the impulse responses functions, we don't really get a very meaningful results, especially uh, now, you know, at that time we were using the, uh, you know, the, the Bayesian method by Jonas Arias. Um, you can imagine those confidence bands don't really give us any information. But uh, on top of that, we actually have a following paper on um, so this was not something that we have done in this paper, but we wanted to look at cross-country differences uh, in terms of the effects of supply chain disruptions. Right now, we are looking at China and uh, United States, and for China, we're actually trying to disentangle uh, this uh, exchange rate depreciation coming from the lower rate and supply chain disruptions. I know, you know, how, you know how each of them play um, some roles um, in this uh, I would say right now for the aggregate implications for the United States and China, but still working on it. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions in there. Well, if not, we can have a longer break, but thanks a lot, all of you for, for your for your presentations. And I think we got are back at 4.15. Thanks.